I, hello everyone, uh, time for our weekly chat. Uh, and today's topic as uh, described in the story is going to be vent basics and extubation. I think they go together pretty well. Um, and I think there's a lot of, I don't wanna say misunderstanding about vents, but I don't think people know as much as they think they do. And I only say that because after doing three years of residency, I still didn't know, I think a ton of, until you know I spent some time with it. Uh, and some of my wonderful respiratory therapists and some other people getting to know it. So uh, this is vent basics and extubation. We're gonna talk about assist control or AC mode, also known as CMV. We're gonna talk about spontaneous intermittent mechanical ventilation or SIMV. And we're gonna talk about pressure support. And we're gonna talk about these three. There are other ones obviously, but these are the most common ones you're gonna see in the unit. And then at the end, I'm gonna erase some part of this because I don't have enough boardroom. And we're gonna talk about extubation, which is like my favorite thing. I know it's a little weird, but it's my favorite thing to talk about uh, because it is so just simple and we make it so difficult. So, uh, you know, we have a ton of people, which is amazing. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get started, uh, you know, talking about the vent settings. So the first one, assist control, which of course I'm using the wrong color marker for, um, is also called CMV. You're gonna see that as the name. Um, which stands for uh, Controlled Mechanical Ventilation or Assist Control Mode. And I want to be clear that AC mode is distinctly different from volume control mode that we use in the operating room. The, the ICU ventilator is not exactly the same. And what happens in Assist Control Mode, um, we can put in the following parameters. We can enter in our patient's PEEP or our positive end expiratory pressure, and we can put in their FiO2. And these two things are gonna control our oxygenation. And then we can put in our respiratory rate, okay? And that is going to be part of our ventilation. And remember, ventilation is the removal of CO2, oxygenation is your obtaining of oxygen. But depending on if you're a cis control, you can either have it as pressure or volume. Now, most people in the ICU are going to be on volume control because the ARDSNET trials that we use for like mechanical ventilation and low tidal volume ventilation, you can't guarantee a tidal volume with pressure support. I'm sorry, with pressure control. Some breaths are going to be bigger or smaller than others. But with volume control, you dial in and you're guaranteed that volume every time. So, I'm going to put, for the sake of this, you put in tidal volume, but it could also be pressure. And both of these are your CO2 removal. So PEEP and FiO2 are oxygen, respiratory rate, and tidal volume are for your CO2. And in this case, what you're going to get out is a pressure. And that's because, uh, you know, to make a simple example, imagine I have a box this big, okay? And then I have a box this big. And I tell the ventilator, okay, ventilator, I wanna put 500 cc's into each of these boxes. Well, in order to get that same pressure, uh, the same volume into those two boxes, this one's going to have a much higher pressure because of its much smaller area, okay? So if you have to try and push a whole lot of tidal volume into say, uh, lungs that are super tight, or you have like a pneumothorax, you only have one lung open, um, your pressures are going to go up. Patients with ARDS, patients with uh, pneumonias, patients with things that don't allow the lung to fill appropriately or effectively diminish its volume that it can handle will go up in pressure. At the same time, imagine that I have this box and I say I wanna deliver 500 tidal volume into this box, but I say that I wanna do it uh, we'll say I give a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute. What that means is each breath is going to be total of six seconds. And if you have an I to E ratio, which we can also plug in, but is a bit more advanced of one to two or two to one, that means you have two, uh, four seconds to inspire, two seconds to expire. So you have four seconds to get this tidal volume in. But now I say, I want my respiratory rate to go to 20 or 30 breaths per minute. Well, that diminishes the amount of time you push that same tidal volume of 500 into the box, and it's going to raise the pressure because you need to push that same volume in much, much faster, 
Now, the important thing to know about assist control versus volume control mode is that in assist control, and this is something that I didn't know and why it confused me especially, is that in assist control, every time the ventilator is triggered, either you dial in 10 breaths per minute and the vent will give 10 breaths per minute at the tidal volume you give, but if the patient triggers, say they start breathing at 20 times a minute, the ventilator will give the full tidal volume with every triggered breath, and it will give the full tidal volume on every breath that it's meant to give. So I dial in uh, a rate of 10, the patient has a metabolic acidosis, they're breathing 30 times a minute, they're getting that full 500 tidal volume every time they take a breath. And the reason it confused me originally was in the operating room when we put um, volume control mode on the ventilator, it doesn't breathe every time the patient triggers, it just causes the patient and the vent to buck and become desynchronous because the patient is breathing when the ventilator is trying to do its thing. But in this case, every time the patient starts to trigger a breath, the vent will also give that full 500 tidal volume. And so it will help to breathe them down or breathe them to wherever you wanna go. So that's assist control mode. And that's the traditional thing that you're going to see most patients on, especially, you know, well sedated patients. Doc loves traveling, such a great teacher. Thanks doc, one of my uh, amazing mentors. Um, still one of my amazing mentors. Uh, and Dr. Usman, another one of my former mentors. Um, SIMV mode. So this is very similar to assist control mode. Some of you may see it, a lot of places don't use it. And that's predominantly because it was, they thought it would help with liberating people from the ventilator, uh, but it actually doesn't. And so it tends not to be that useful. And it was meant to be more comfortable for, for patients as opposed to assist control. And I'll explain why in a second. So again, in this case, we're going to program in our PEEP we're going to program in our FiO2 the same way. We're going to program in our respiratory rate. And we're going to program in, again, it can be pressure or volume. So in this case, for the example, I'm going to use volume. And the other thing we also program in is our pressure support, which is distinctly different than our assist control mode. And what the pressure support does, what SIMV does, and why it's called spontaneous intermittent mechanical ventilation, is that in AC mode, every breath that's triggered by the vent, like it's supposed to do, or the patient triggers, causes the full tidal volume to be given. But in SIMV, this is what your volume time loop is going to look like, is that you're not going to get the full tidal volume every time, you're just going to get the pressure support on those intermittent breaths that the patient takes. So imagine again, I breathe them at 10 times, 10 breaths per minute. They're going to get that full 500 tidal volume, but when they trigger the vent on their own, they're not going to jump up to that full tidal volume. You can have a pressure support of zero, in which case they have to do all the work on their own, or maybe you put in a pressure support of five, or 10, and they'll get a little bit of support in between. But then when it's on that like 10 breaths per minute schedule, it is going to give that full tidal volume breath. And that's how SIMD works. That's what makes it intermittent because you're not getting the full tidal volume programmed every breath. It's only intermittent individually um, in this, you know, system. Now, the reason this was kind of defined and used supposed to be to be more comfortable for patients was that imagine you're kind of awake in the ICU and you're intubated and the ventilator gives you a 500 tidal volume breath. And every time you trigger, it's giving you 500 tidal volume. Every time it's just pushing tons of air into you. It can be very uncomfortable for patients if you're not appropriately sedated because every time it's just slamming air into you. In SIMV, you're getting tidal volumes, but then you're able to breathe on your own in between. The problem becomes, and a lot of patients develop anxiety from this, is that imagine you're short of breath and you're on the ventilator and you're intubated and you're anxious and you get a nice 500 tidal volume here, but then here, you don't get that same support and you're maybe taking tidal volumes of, I don't know, 30 cc's or 40 cc's. 
that's really disconcerting as a patient to feel like you need to breathe and you try to, and you're not getting that volume in that you need because your, your diaphragm is weak and you're decompensated and you are relying on that vent to help give you that pressure. So this ends up sometimes causing patients to be very anxious, causing them to hyperventilate, to be relatively uncomfortable. That being said, in the operating room, I definitely use PS, uh, I'm sorry, well, uh, SIMV uh, volume mode because at the end of the case, when I'm making sure, you know, obviously the OR is different than the ICU, I like to use uh, SIMV so that when the patient is triggering the vent to breathe, I can see what they're doing in between the breaths that I'm delivering to them. So I can see, oh, this breath was by the machine, but they're triggering these other breaths in between and they're taking more than enough tidal volume for me to get to extubate them. And that's towards the end of the case. And then I go to pressure support and, you know, the way that I wean patients from the vent. So SIMV and AC mode are very similar with the difference being predominantly that you don't get that full tidal volume every time, but rather as the name suggests, only intermittently or the pr same pressure. And you can adjust how much support they're getting in each one of these breaths. Wonderful. The last mode that we need to talk about, again, the last uh, commonly used mode is pressure support um, and literally the only thing we're going to plug in here is our FiO2, which is our oxygen percent, and we're literally just going to give them a pressure support. And the idea in this case is that, and we'll do a pressure time loop or graph here, is that this is when we're getting ready to extubate the patient. We want them to, I'm sorry, I'll answer the question at the, the, question at the end, but uh, yes. Um, with our pressure time loop, when we put up someone on pressure support, what we're going to do is we're not going to give them any breaths. We're going to rely on them to trigger the vent. The patient's going to trigger the vent. And all we're going to say is, okay, every time you trigger the vent, you're going to get 10 centimeters of water worth of pressure in that breath uh, or five or however much you want to give in order to um, support them. And then also we can give them some amount of PEEP um, because obviously we want to keep our alveoli open uh, while they're exhaling. Um, and that, you know, gets more into the respiratory physiology of why our alveoli stay open versus closed. And what we're going to have is we're going to have the patient triggers the breath so it gets a negative pressure scene. Then it's going to shoot up to get you to whatever pressure you program them in for. And it's going to stay like that until they're ready to exhale and then they're going to trigger the vent again, and it's going to go up and across the same way. Thank you, Rishi. I can't believe how many viewers are here. It's unbelievable. I'm reaching your numbers. No, kidding. Um, but our pressure support is going to give us um, a pressure to help assist our patient breathing. And predominantly, we're going to use this one when we want to exercise our patient's lungs to let that, or their diaphragm get them to start breathing on their own and not be completely uh, dependent on the vent. But most importantly, we use this a lot of times to see if we can extubate people because we don't want to support them anymore. We just want to see, can they breathe enough on their own? And so we give them that pressure support. And a lot of times we'll even say, okay, you get zero over zero. You get zero pressure support. You get zero peep. And let's see how you do, because depending on the kind of patient and how long the weaning process is going, we want to make sure that this person is going to fly when we take that tube out. Um, and some people might need more. We have like very obese patients, very heavy patients where they have very high transpulmonary pressures and they need that extra PEEP in order to breathe normally. So pressure support we predominantly use again for weaning or getting ready to liberate from the vent or when we're trying to exercise our patient's lungs and stuff. So the last thing I want to talk about here quickly, and again, these are just the major kinds of uh, things that we use. Um, you know, there are other settings that really haven't been studied too, too much as far as mortality things. I love you too, Mo. Um, yes, it will be saved uh, both on my IGTV here and on my YouTube page. And yes, we will do an OR specific video in the future. Um, vent liberation. People say weaning. Weaning uh, is not exactly the term. Liberation um, is really kind of what we use because liberation means to remove somebody and you don't always have to wean somebody. You can just say the patient came out from surgery, they're in the ICU, we leave them, and then we say, okay, turn the vent off, put them on zero over zero, let them breathe and take the tube out. There's no weaning involved. They just breathe by themselves. 
So the, uh, the, the liberation from the vent, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about because it's, it's so crazy to me that people get pimped on this and then don't know the answers. It's exactly what you think it is. There is no tricks here. There's nothing that you shouldn't know because it's all very common sense. So when considering if you can vent, uh, liberate somebody from the vent, the first thing you wanna know is, are they breathing? Meaning, is the patient not apneic? Are they taking breaths by themselves? Because it would stand to reason that you cannot extubate somebody who is not breathing by themselves. Uh, thank you, Christiane, one of the phenomenal nurses that I worked with. Um, absolutely wonderful, she's gonna be great. Um, but you need to see if they're breathing by themselves. I, and people just forget this for some reason, maybe because it becomes intuitive. Next, we want to know, are they hemodynamically stable? And it may seem silly, and you can take people off the vent who are on a little bit of pressure, who are on epi and inotropes, but are they stable enough to be taken off? Because if you extubate somebody who is hemodynamically going to crump, you're going to be reintubating them. So do you think from a hemodynamic, hemodynamic standpoint that they are going to tolerate being off the ventilator? Again, not rocket science. It's very obvious. Uh, the next thing, uh, we're going to mention here something called our RSBI, which is our RISPI. Um, and we're looking for values less than 105. And our RISPI is our rapid shallow breathing index. And the equation for this, I'm going to kind of move this off over here, is your respiratory rate over your tidal volume. And the reason I remember that, and this is in liters, that it's rate over tidal volume is that it's called rapid shallow. So it's the speed over the tidal volume, rapid shallow. So rapid comes first. And if you have a respiratory rate, say of 10, and you're breathing at a liter, uh, so one liter, your RSBI is 10, and therefore you are less than 105. But say you're breathing at a rate of 30, and you're taking tidal volumes of 200, uh, or point uh, of, yeah, uh, point two you're going to have a, uh, an RSBI of greater than 105, and you are more than likely going to fail at that point. The next thing is NIF, which is another thing we can look at, which is our negative inspiratory force. And you're looking for a negative inspir inspiratory force of minus 30 centimeters of water. And basically you wanna see, can they with their innate diaphragm, take a big deep breath and generate that appropriate force in order to, um, you know, breathe on their own. And these are kind of like the big things that we're going to look at. Are they breathing? Are they hemodynamically stable? Are they breathing at an appropriate rate? You know, is their temperature okay? All these kinds of things. They're, they're very kind of, it, it's nothing crazy. It's just, are they breathing slowly and taking deep breaths? Are they breathing spontaneously? And are they hemodynamically stable to have the vent removed? And then kind of the last thing is what is their gas exchange like? Um, because all of these other things tend to be mechanics. Are they breathing? How are they breathing? But a lot of times we have to look at their vent. We have to say, well, you know, uh, are their blood gas? What's their CO2? Do they need the extra? You know, are they going to stop? You know, are they going to start retaining? How is their oxygenation? Maybe they need that PEEP. Maybe they need that high FiO2. They're not going to come off the ventilator very well because we can't give the same support that we can with an endotracheal tube, but maybe you can do it with a, a mask or, or some type of high flow. So you need to make sure their gas exchange and their oxygen, their CO2 and all these things are also appropriate.